All righty. Well, hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Officially 12.01 p.m. here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Thank you so much for tuning in. Before we get going too far into this, if y'all could just let me know in the chats, in the comments, if you can hear us okay, if the data is coming through to all of you. Uh, thanks for letting us know. But in the meantime, while we wait for folks to come on in and get that notification that we are live, my name's Patrick. I work for the Monterey Bay Aquarium social media team over here to this side coming in. That's Emily. Emily is going to be making sure that we get all of your questions. She is also going to be making sure that our uh, illustrious guest is looking uh, perfectly fine over there. Uh, we are, as you can see, not currently in our living rooms. You folks out there might know Emily and me from the quarantine where we've been at home, but we're here at the aquarium right now in a very special place because we are almost ready to reopen to the general public. Oh, I'm getting all choked up just thinking about it. So for those of you folks that are tuning in, if your first question for us is when are we reopening? Well, do not worry. We are going to be reopening very soon. If you are a member, your member days start May 1 through 14. You can start to reserve your tickets on April 26th on our website. All tickets are online reservations, so MonteryBayAquarium.org there. And then if you are not a member, you will have access to the aquarium on May 15th, and your tickets will become available on May 5th on MonteryBayAquarium.org once again. So if that was your first question for us, when do you get to come back to the aquarium? Well, now you know, and again, MonteryBayAquarium.org for more information. But this right here is our second installment of, hey, remember this? And yesterday we were hanging out with Jessica over at the sea otter exhibit. However, today we are in one of my favorite places in the whole aquarium. We are currently live at the kelp forest exhibit. And I can show you that kelp forest exhibit right here. You can see it's a pretty cloudy, murky day uh, in the kelp forest and also here in the Monterey Bay. Um, but to tell us a little bit about what's going on in the kelp forest and what's been going on for the last year, she can tell us a little bit about what's going on there uh, with that water. You may have noticed on our kelp forest cam, we are now going to go live over to Kelsey. Oh my goodness, the technology is working. And Kelsey, you are live right now. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you guys doing today? Oh, doing excellent over here. Kelsey, we've got uh, Emily over there making sure that we're looking good, that we sound good, we look good over there, Emily? Good. Looking good. All right, well, Kelsey, my first question uh, to you over there, you're right there in front of the kelp forest exhibit. Can you tell us a little bit about your role with the kelp forest? Uh, we've got a, a leopard shark there going on uh, right there behind you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what your job is here at the aquarium and uh, who do we have there behind you? Yeah, my name is Kelsey. I am a senior aquarist here at Monterey Bay Aquarium, and I am in charge of the team that is in charge of this kelp forest exhibit. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it in general. Uh, we've got a lot of different animals. We train fish in here. We take care of the sharks. We feed all the fishes. We take care of the algae. We just added some bull kelp that you could see behind me. We just added those last week, which I'm very excited about and it's been a bit of a crazy year. <laughs> yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about the year that you've been having with the Kelp Forest exhibit? Because uh, we have had quite a few folks there watching the Kelp Forest cam, which you might be able to see. Oh, it's right above my head right here, the Kelp Forest cam. Looking at this exhibit, you may have seen a lot of different activity happening during our closure in the Kelp Forest exhibit. That's Kelsey and her team diving in there all the time, making sure the animals are doing okay. May have seen those training sessions. You also may have seen some construction work going on, lots of big repairs. So uh, Kelsey, tell us a little bit about what has been going on there uh, for the last year here in the Kelp Forest. Lots to talk about. So much to talk about. 2020 kind of uh, made Kelp Forest tank explode as well. Uh, so we had a whole form in our exhibit in the rock work, and we were able to get an underwater construction company to come out to help repair it. But part of it is back up and running the surge machine that is at the top that you see the waves going back and forth. That was the center of the problem is that after 36 plus years, everything wasn't lining up as well. So they had to cut more holes in the rock work and they had to repair the cylinder and the shaft that went into um, the cylinder in order to make the wave movement. And that was a very, very large project that took over a month. Uh, but that, is, that part is done now. 
Uh, so we've got the wave machine back on, and then of course about a week after construction ended, our wave machine broke in a different place. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I, I almost cried, <laughs> I, if I'm being honest. It was rough. Um, and, but we were able to send out the parts to a specialty company here and get that replaced, but the wave machine was down for another couple of weeks. And it recently got completely fixed last week. And so we've got, we've got waves back, and then everything was going great. We added bulk help in anticipation, and now we've got a plankton bloom in the, in the Monterey Bay with a lot of diatoms that are coming in. So some of those we normally see is Catoceros, um, the Thallus, I always mess up this pronunciation, Thallus socera, some Pseudonychia, which is one of the hazardous ones, but it's not very prevalent. But the big one that's causing this green color is Proboscia um, that just started up this last week because the world knows that we're reopening, so they wanted to make it <laughs> a little harder for you guys to see, to keep on combating. So our control room is working very hard on our filters. Uh, some of this is obviously beneficial. We want this coming into the aquarium, but we do want you guys to see. It's getting better. So hopefully by May 1st, it'll be perfect. It is in Kelsey's, in my aquarium. It's, it's perfect. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, so much going on uh, with that exhibit as, as you're just talking about there, uh, Kelsey, from the, the physical aspect of the enclosure, and then you have the water that's coming in directly off of the back deck of the aquarium from the wild Monterey Bay, really the secret sauce there to the aquarium. But sometimes the sauce is a little spicier, um, whether we've got the jellies or the, or the, the diatoms in there. Um, and uh, just very quickly, I want to give some instructions there to, uh, to the chat that's watching over on Twitch, over on Twitter, um, on Facebook, and on YouTube. If you could just say, great job, Kelsey and co, in the comments. That way, if Kelsey goes back and watches this, she can get that support. Because I know you folks out there have really been appreciating everything going on with, um, with the, the Kelp Forest exhibit, maintaining it throughout this closure. And so if you could just go into the chat and just say, thank you, Kelsey, um, just so that Kelsey can see that. Uh, because um, obviously without having the visitors in the building, it's all you folks out there digitally watching. So uh, if you could just let her know how much everything is appreciated uh, over there. Look, we got, we got Emily showing the, showing the comments over there. Yeah, right on. Um, okay, but so Kelsey, I did want to talk a little bit more about that surge machine. Um, and the reason I want to talk a little bit more about that surge machine behind you is that that is of secret sauces of, uh, of kelp forest. That surge machine is really important. And you have a really cool visual aid that you wanted to show us a little bit more of. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what you got there. So when the surge machine was off, both during the first round of construction and then the round when it was broken for a while, the kelp is still growing in here, but it doesn't have any of this wave action. So it kind of grows up a little weak. It grows quickly, especially when it's sunny, it shoots up, but it doesn't grow big, beautiful fronds. It's not very quality kelp, maybe you can call it. So since this got turned back on, some of those weaker pieces have been falling off. And so hopefully we'll be able to see this. This I actually just got off the surface today. So it's a whole strand of kelp, and the bottom about two thirds, if you guys can see, it's got really small, the fronds are, we're gonna be tiny. All of these bulbs are really small put together. This is a very thin stipe. It's just kind of weak kelp. If there were fronds, they've been clearly knocked off by now. But if you go, you can almost see a definitive line when we turn the surge machine back on. And so you see how nice and big and strong these are. And they're spaced out more regularly. It, it's, it's amazing, the difference. Yeah, it is. It's literally, if you go side by side here, you can see. So this weak stuff is breaking off. And we will be using this in other parts of the aquarium. But it is cool to see on a whole big thing. You can almost see that line right there. Even if you compare these two bulbs right next to each other, they're like, Four times the size. Wow. Once you get some uh, 
wave action going on here. So this is a good representation of why we have that surge machine, why water motion works, and why when you're taking care of live algae, why it's important for us to be able to display something so beautifully. And yeah, just to uh, just to you know to Kelsey's point, I don't know if we've mentioned it in this broadcast, but we should for every broadcast. This was the first exhibit in the world to have a living, growing kelp forest in it. Um, so what you're looking at there in front of you is a view that people did not get to see uh, before we opened in 1984 in an aquarium with that living, growing kelp forest there. So um, very. Uh, I mean, groundbreaking still, and really you had to think like a kelp to be able to grow that. And so Kelsey there just showing off beautifully. And honestly, um, I've never seen that, uh, that demonstration before there, Kelsey. So um, add that down for weeks at a time or um, five weeks with the first round of construction. Uh, we've never had that before. That's what 2020 and 2021 has done with the kelp forest. So that's also part of our job is keeping the kelp, kelp healthy, keeping everything looking good. Uh, we did add, we tried to add in some additional pumps to make up for it, but nothing is, can really match, match our surge machine, our wave machine. I'll just um, point out that uh, that surge machine was uh, designed by a gentleman, Randy Hamilton, and it was welded by David Packard himself. You folks out there may have seen David Packard's name in the news recently. One of the founders of the aquarium, Julie Packard, his daughter, still our, uh, our director. Um, but you may know that our colleagues over at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute are getting a brand new research vessel that will be the research vessel, David Packard. So for you, you folks out there following us on Twitter, following what Mbari is doing, um, fun little anecdote there for the surge machine welded uh, in David Packard's uh, workshop there. Um, so with that, we've been live for a little bit here. I wanna make sure that we're getting to uh, some questions. What are some of the main things um, that, oh, uh, we've got somebody pointing out, uh, we've got Wilderness Gay pointing out over on Twitch um, uh, that you are indeed kelp C. that you folks. Oh, I've done a couple of these live uh, shows and I think after the first one, some, pe some of you people in the audience have named me Kelpsy, which I don't know how nobody in my family or friend circle <laughs> caught on to that at all. Uh, so yes, yeah, several people call me Kelpsy now. Uh, my sister is a big crafter and she made me a custom sticker, Kelpsy. And so yes, feel free to call me Kelpsy. I answer to both. <laughs> Um, so Emily, I just want to uh, ask you, what, what kind of questions have you been seeing while I've been uh, doing a slightly better job of producing this show than, than the last time? Uh, Emily, what are some questions for the folks? Can you hear me if I talk real loud? Okay, I'll talk real loud over here. <laughs> um, so you just mentioned you've done a couple of these before, Kelsey. Uh, if anyone tuned in to some of those before, uh, you may remember uh, that you are not just an aquarist here at the aquarium, you are also a gardener of this exhibit. Uh, so folks are curious, where does the kelp come from in here? How do we get all of these beautiful bull kelps and giant kelp and where does it all come from? Well, a lot of the giant kelp, when the aquarium first opened, we did collect from the wild. But we have been doing such a good job at keeping it alive and keeping it healthy that it actually reproduces on exhibit. So one of the things that we do is we can go, especially along the back walls and especially higher up, we have kelp hold fast that form and that grow out and we can actually transplant them for lack of a better term, trans algae. Now it's transplant. <laughs> I know it's an algae, but we transplant them. Uh, where we weigh them down um, with some designated dive weights, move them onto the reefs, the hold fast grow over the dive weights, and then the kelp continues to grow. So that's mainly what we do with the macrocystis kelp. With our big bull kelp, I do go collect that in the, um, in the wild in Monterey Bay, especially around the corner in Carmel. I usually go after the drift pieces that are already floating. Um, so, and then we can add those to weights. We do get bull kelp growing in here, uh, but most of the opali, are they eating it now? Yeah, most of the opali 
eat the bull kelp away before it can get really big. But it is a project I've been working on is transplanting smaller ones into a garden, into the same area. And once they're concentrated, the opali leave them away, uh, leave them alone for a little bit. So it's, so, mm -hmm. uh, Kelsey, I'm just gonna go real quick to a wider shot. And uh, I don't know um, if you want, you can walk out of that camera. Oh, look at us go. In, hold on, let me oh, get rid of it. Almost perfect. Here, wait, go back, go back. Try it, try, try one more time. Okay, go ahead, walk up. Hey, look at that production right there. Um, so can you, um, it's a little bit hard to see. I'm gonna zoom in uh, just a little bit, but can you point out the giant kelp uh, and the bull kelp for the folks who uh, may not be familiar? This reef right here, uh, the giant kelp that's all fluffy on the bottom and then grows up and has multiple stipes and multiple fronds growing all the way up, that's giant kelp. Uh, if you look to the right and you see one big lawn stipe going up there and a big bulb at the top and all of these flat blades going down, kind of looks like uh, we've done mermaid's hair before, going down, that is bull kelp, that is neriocystis. So we've got those two right there, we should be able, can you see the one on the other side of the reef in that shot too? Because yeah. that's a good shot of the bull kelp over there as well. Oh, and Emily has uh, made it look super sweet. Oh, good. So let's see if I can go to the yeah, especially at the top. You can even tell the difference in texture because that bull kelp is flat and almost shiny, whereas the macrocystis is more, a little bit more curved looks a little bit more like a leaf on a tree that we'd be familiar with. And it's also got some texture there too. So even if they're next to each other and you can't see the whole plant, you can usually tell by the texture, which is which. Yeah, perfect. So, uh, oh, I'm trying to point out, oh, Emily. So, oh no, I messed, I messed, I'm messing everything up. Okay, we're back on the bull kelp. <laughs> and uh, look, at it, look at us go. We thought we had the, the production down to a uh, science. Okay, okay, now back to you, uh, Kelsey, over um, there. And then uh, to any questions that, uh, that folks may have, um, we'll go to Emily, because it appears that the questions have died over on Twitch for me. I got them. Oh, Emily's got the question. So here you go, Kelsey. All right, uh, this was actually a really great question. I love it. Um, how does the inverse relationship between this increased productivity that we're seeing right now in the water and the reducing, it reduces the visibility of light actually affect the growth of kelp? Because obviously it needs sunlight to grow, but in this cloudy water, it's getting more nutrients, but it's also less sunlight. Yeah. <laughs> My job to figure out uh, it, on days, if there's, if it's not sunny enough in a row, uh, and it's really overcast, you've got to factor that in. If we get too many days in a row where it's just completely clouded out, you have to factor that in. Um, and it's a balance. Yeah, it's 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 give and take, but it's that right mixture um, of everything that is what Monterey Bay has really excelled in. Um, it's also the water movement is another factor with that. Uh, some people say you can see it easier if it's not moving back and forth, but it needs to move back and forth to get that good growth. So it's a little bit of everything in the perfect mixture all of the time. And it's not perfect all the time, um, but we do the best we can with that. Yeah, and a uh, shout out to uh, Team Water Quality and everybody else uh, out there making sure that things are looking good. You folks out there on Twitch might know a little bit more about uh, Team Water Quality. They've been on some of our, of our live streams over there. Um, but yeah, an amazing group of folks there behind the scenes making sure that everything is looking good. And uh, we've set up our camera to transition beautifully back to your original starting spot, Kelsey, if you would like. And uh, folks, if you are just tuning in right now, uh, my name is Patrick. I work for the Monterey Bay Aquarium social media team. You may have seen Emily, who's right over here. Emily's monitoring all of your questions. And we're here live right now at the Kelp Forest exhibit with Kelsey, uh, senior aquarist Kelsey, making sure that everything is looking good in our Kelp Forest exhibit. And we're here right now just to remind everybody that the aquarium is getting ready to reopen. So if you are just tuning in right now, if you didn't hear us say this before, 
The aquarium is gonna be reopening May 1st through the 14th exclusively for our members. And those tickets for members will be available online for reservation, monterebayaquarium.org. Those will be available on April 26th, so this coming Monday. Um, and then for the rest of the folks out there, you will be able to come and visit the aquarium starting May 15th. And those reservations will be going live on May 5th on our website, again, montereybayaquarium.org. All online reservations, more information over there on the website. But that's why we're here back inside the aquarium. We've been closed. We're going to have been closed 14 months by the time we reopen to everybody. And uh, so we're just checking in right now with this series of what's been going on at the aquarium while we've been closed. We did sea otters yesterday, if you want to take a look at that. And right now we are live at the aquarium with Kelsey. And uh, just a quick question for you, uh, Kelsey, we talked a little bit about some of the stuff going on with the construction and, and, um, and all of the, the moves. And right now we've got the, the plankton bloom happening. But what's been uh, a, a favorite fun little anecdote that happened during quarantine that the folks uh, at home maybe didn't, uh, didn't know was what was happening with, with the kelp forest exhibit? Do you have any uh, fun stories of things that happened there? Uh, a lot of window cleaning from staff members, okay. which was interesting for us to get used to because normally we have a whole squadron of volunteers that help us out. And this exhibit, Getting Natural Sunlight, the algae builds up quick as Patrick can attest to being one of those divers from time to time. So it was me bullying a lot of my team members asking if they could jump in to help clean. Uh, if, if I found out that they were diving in another exhibit that day, I would come and find them and ask them to, to jump in with me then. So what, what's a preferred bribe for a kelp forest czar trying to get uh, somebody to come dive uh, into the exhibit? Is it, is it burritos? Is it cookies? What, what, what's a good bribe for any of you out there who might have a problem, a, a similar issue? Good. Uh, cookies are usually good and actually breakfast burritos seem to be the way to go. Okay. If you get to people early enough and you get breakfast burritos going on, that seems to be good. And if they really don't want to, then you get a thing of bulk kelp, which is really whippy on the other side. Oh, okay. That's what happens when you anger Kelpsy. Yeah, don't <laughs> Do not anger Kelpsy. That is certainly words to, to live by there. Um, Emily, going to you, uh, how's it looking in the chat? Everything okay over there? Everything's good. <laughs> um, I am simultaneously collecting questions and trying to answer them in the chat. Uh, but we did have this really interesting one, Kelsey, from over on Facebook. Uh, since we have been closed the last 14 months here and we get our water coming in from the bay, sometimes unfiltered water, has anything unexpected popped up? Something new popped up within the last 14 months since people have been here? Oh, goodness. I wish I had an answer off the top of my head for that. Some species of algae have popped up in kelp forest that previously have not. Uh, I've gotten feather boa kelp growing in a couple places all on its own, which I hadn't seen before. But that's interesting for nerds like me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have had decor a couple of decorator crabs behind the scenes popped up in tents in, in tanks that we didn't know that they were there. And what's funny is they come in when they're small, and when you see them, they're like the size of a quarter plus. And it's like, how did I go that long without seeing any of those guys? So we do have some of those critters pop up from time to time. Excellent. We have a question for you, Kelsey, that we get pretty frequently. Uh, do any of the animals in here have names? Have you named every fish there that's in front of you? No. <laughs> Uh, no, and that is a common question that we get. Um, here at the aquarium, we, uh, the only ones that are named are like the sea otters and the penguins that can respond to our names. Uh, if so, if that's the case, then all of these fish are named bubble, 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 because that's all they really hear <laughs> underwater. Um, we do have training programs for two of these fish in here for our giant sea bass that are actually going very well. If we refer to them as anything, it's usually large and small because that's the size differential. Large is about 125 pounds and small came in at 30 pounds at the last weighing, if I remember correctly. 
So they do not have names, but they are all special. They are all special to me, even though they're not named. Sorry. Oh, no worries. No, that audio is totally fine compared to what I was doing yesterday. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a really great question we get all the time, whether or not these animals have names. Feel free to come up with your own nicknames for yourselves if you'd like, but you get to see those training sessions happening with the giant sea basses on what days of the week, if somebody wants to, to tune in and take a look, is that on a schedule? What, how, how do people watch it? It's usually Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but we have given ourselves some flexibility, especially since we've been closed. Sometimes diverse schedules just do not line up. We actually had to go down to twice a week for the first uh, six months of the pandemic just due to staffing. Uh, but we have kept up on their training. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, we do train our sea bass to swim into these vinyl stretchers underwater. And then we can use, once they're in the stretchers, we can use them to come out to get exams, to get weighed, to do fresh water baths. And since they're so used to and comfortable with the stretcher, um, we, uh, it's, it's a lot less stressful on the fish. The smaller one in here is a little rock star, and I don't play favorites, but I've worked with that fish for a long time. <laughs> and it's a very cool fish. And it's now fully trained up to where uh, I believe our next bath, we, we can use the target, get him in the stretcher, close it up, and everything will be fine. The larger one we haven't been able to work with as much. Um, I was able to work with the smaller one when it was a smaller fish in different, um, in different exhibits in the aquarium. So that one's had a couple of extra years of training. Um, our large one is coming along and is doing well. Uh, hey, there we go. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Did you get both of those? Yeah, there they go, off to the right. Oh. Sometimes the larger one gets a little bit territorial with the smaller one, which is natural. Yeah, so, so then tell us uh, what we just saw there. Kelsey, a little bit of territoriality. Yeah, a little bit of territoriality with that larger one. What is interesting is that when the smaller one first got put in, was about 10, 15 pounds less and did not be, was not seen as much of a threat. But as that fish has, as the smaller fish has getting bigger, there also is, we've got a sheep head in here, a male sheep head hiding now because he knew, knows I'm talking about him. Um, that was larger than the smaller sea bass uh, when they first got put in. But as the smaller sea bass has gotten larger, uh, we've seen some territory, a little bit of chasing going on in there. It's normally not too extreme, um, but for a while, for a couple weeks, if you look really closely at the smaller one, you saw a little half moon shape out of its, uh, just a little scrape by its dorsal fin. And if you see the sheephead's mouth right next to that shape, yeah, so sheephead took a little nip. Everybody seems fine. It's a little bit like toddlers getting, you know, they get along, well, no, not most of the time. <laughs> Yeah, like, it's neighbor kids. Get along until they get uh, so do, sometimes you do see some of that chasing going on. Um, we also know that the larger one is a female based off of the body shape and some of the other indicators. The smaller one is a little too small to tell, but once it gets bigger, depending on if it's a female or a male, you might see some of those that will either be territorial disputes or it's amazing how much it looks like mating rituals too. There's a lot of chasing going on with the mating too. The little guy's too small for it to be that probably, but. Yeah, and um, the question that we have uh, from Celestina Kitty over on Twitch and a few other folks are probably wondering this, uh, different sizes because they're different ages, right? Um, and so can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the history of that giant sea bass, um, the larger one that uh, I'm sure folks have seen for, for a while here uh, at the aquarium, and then that young sea bass that they also may have seen for a while, but looking a little bit different. So the larger one we got in 2006, so that is 15 years ago now. Um, I cannot find any records of how much it actually was, but based off of the pattern, it, pro it probably was the size that the small one is now. Um, and it grew up in our Holdfast exhibit oh. in Kelpstone. Hey, it's hey, sweetie. Up again to say hello. There we go. And uh, and then we've been since 2011. It's gotten weighed annually, so we've been able to track the growth. So that one is likely about a 20 to 25 year uh, old. You want to come up again? 
uh, sea bass. Our smaller one in there was one of the teeny tiny ones that we got in 2015. It actually was 0.98 grams when it came in. For reference, a paper clip weighs a gram, so it weighed less than a paper clip when it came in. And we've been able to grow up that one. Uh, it was in our seaweed garden in kelp zone. It was underneath the touch table. It went into the hold fast. We had it behind the scenes for a while. So we've been able to get really good documentation and growth rates of that fish in captivity. And so this is its last step is going in here. And what's been fun, especially for me, is that this is the first time we've had two sea bat, two giant sea bass on this exhibit. We do have three in Monterey Bay habitats and we've been able to see how they interact with each other. So it's been interesting to see some of the similarities and differences between the way those three over there uh, work and cooperate with each other and these two over here uh, live with each other. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for all that extra information there, Kelsey, about the giant sea bass, one of those iconic animals and part of a conservation program the aquarium has been working on uh, for a while, um, studying how those spot patterns develop over time, if it's a, 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 a fingerprint, uh, some kind of identification card for those animals in the wild. So we've been working on those giant sea bass there for a long time. There's actually a video over on our YouTube channel if you want to learn more about that conservation success story. Uh, we have a question super quick about what the official pizza toppings of the Monterey Bay Aquarium are. Uh, doesn't really matter as long as there's sea salt on the crust. So moving on from that question, because I know it was a redeemed one over there on Twitch. Um, one of the questions that we had yesterday, uh, Kelsey, over with the sea otters um, is, uh, did the otters miss the people and very clearly Jessica was saying, yeah, you know, the, the otters, like they get really excited to, to see other people. Uh, similar question to you right now for the Kelp Forest exhibit. Can you tell if any of the animals here have missed the people? As a diver in there, I can tell you that they get very excited for the diver to, to come in uh, with some food. But can you tell us, have you seen behavioral changes uh, with these uh, with, with these critters uh, during during our closure? They definitely miss the divers because pre-pandemic they were getting fed twice a day, every day, seven days a week by divers. And when we went down to, we were diving once a day, three days a week is, is all we could staff. Uh, if you were one of those first days, you kind of got swarmed. <laughs> and then when we went in later to feed the sea bass, which was a separate dive, the leopard sharks are all over you. So we have seen differences with that. I have to say, I haven't seen too many differences with people, with the fish inside the tank reacting to people outside the tank. Um, but as a diver inside the tank, it was really weird to get used to looking up and not seeing anybody at all. So it was weird for me, if I count as a, as a an oh, yeah. critter inside the tank, it was weird for me. You're Kelpsy. I'm Kelpsy. It was weird not seeing people. So I am excited for that aspect to come back, to be doing what I love and feeding fish and doing training programs and look up and see people looking back at me. I'm looking forward to that. That's awesome. Can you uh, tell us a little bit more about your job? There's some questions about how we get your job. <laughs> um, uh, you work with animals since you're 14 and you take every science class you can and spend a lot of time outdoors uh, is basically what I've done. Um, I've worked at a vet clinic, I've worked at an IMS nutritional facility, um, I've worked at a ranch, so I've worked with animals and then I got a degree in zoology uh, from Washington State and I, after I graduated I got an internship at an aquarium. Um, up in Tacoma, Washington. And then I also, after college, started scuba diving. And once I started scuba diving, it was over. I, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with everything underwater. So, worked at that aquarium for about a year. And then I got a job down here 11 and a half years ago. Where does time go? I swear. I just had my five year anniversary and then it was your 10 and now I'm not saying it's, it'll be 12 years in July. So I've worked all over in this aquarium. I worked at a lot of our temporary exhibits, worked all over the cold water side, 
Um, I was in charge of Monterey Bay Habitat's exhibit uh, for several years, and now I'm on year three or four. Seriously, time, it's crazy. And the pandemic just messes with your sense of time. So I think I'm on year four of being in charge of kelp forest exhibit as well. Excellent. And um, uh, just for the folks over there on YouTube, we did enable the closed captions. They might, they seem to not be showing up, at least for some folks, but uh, don't worry at the end of this broadcast, once we're done, there will be automatically generated captions showing up there uh, over there on YouTube. I think things are working on Facebook. If they're not, let us know. Um, but yeah, thank you for the feedback over there on YouTube. Thank you, Kelsey, for talking a little bit more about your background there. And then uh, we're about to wrap up here shortly to head over to Instagram Live and share uh, the same type of experience over there. And uh, maybe even TikTok Live if we've got enough time over there. So if you folks are following us on Instagram, on TikTok, if you want to see a little bit more of uh, the Kelp Forest, we'll be doing that very soon. Um, so if you have any uh, questions for us, put them in the chat right now so we can get uh, that to, to you, Kelsey. But one of the questions that we're always getting, and I'm sure uh, you have to come up with a new diplomatic uh, answer every single time, what is your favorite animal in the kelp forest? Or if not your favorite, what are your, what's your top three for today, completely non-committal? Okay, I'll give you a top three and two of them I have tattooed on me. So <laughs> once, you, once you get the tattoos, I've got a wolf eel. All right. I've, I've got um, a giant sea bass as well tattooed on me. So those are two of my favorites. Um, and the third one, I actually really like the leopard sharks in here. Part of that is I like sharks in general. Um, but these ones have been fun to work with and unique to work with, especially since so many of them have been here for so long. So in a perfect world, I'd do a training program for them too. But there's only so many hours in the day to get everything you want done. All right, well, there you go. You're there, everybody. Oh, sorry, let me turn on my audio. You heard it there, everybody. So Wolf Eel, Giant Sea Bass for life, uh, committed over there for, for Kelsey. So uh, if you folks out there have any favorite kelp forest critters, you can put those in the chat for us um, as well. Let us know what your favorites are. Um, and uh, yeah, I think with that, unless there are any other pressing questions. I mean, we've, got lots of questions. we've got lots of questions. Okay, all right, we're gonna go to some rapid fire, uh, maybe with, with Emily. So here, let me put you back on camera here, Kelsey. I have to remember not to answer too, too much in depth with these. That was my problem <laughs> with one of the times. I wanna give all the information. Sounds good. Okay, ready for rapid fire then from Emily. Okay, Kelsey, do you have a favorite part of your job? Program. Good answer. Good answer. Yay. <laughs> All right. What happens if a fish gets sick? Do you have to catch it by hand? Oh, if we can. Normally we use nets. Uh, and then that's also part of our job to make sure everything's healthy. And if they're not, we can usually use two nets to scoop them out. And we do have uh, vet staff on site to, to help us take care of that sick animal. All right, this one might be tough for a rapid fire, but if you had an unlimited budget, like m dreaming anything, what would you do to the kelp forest? I would add 200 wolf eels to it. <laughs> <laughs> I love them so much. I uh, started scuba diving in Seattle and and uh, diving in Puget sounds amazing. And the first time seeing them in the wild, I, yeah, it was amazing. So many more wolf feels. Oh, that's gonna be fun to think about. I'm gonna be working on that question later too, but that's my, that's my rapid fire answer. All right, Kelsey, how many gallons of seawater are inside of this exhibit? A third of a million gallons total. Um, all right, do we do anything if things go out of balance to the seawater in here? Mm. Uh, normally, we get raw seawater coming in at night. So all of those diatoms that I was mentioning, all of the plankton coming in, um, we that would just go straight onto the exhibit. And then the filters get turned on, oh, about three or four in the morning, depending on how thick it is. On days like today, when this much is getting in, we do not add any what we call raw seawater 
unfiltered seawater overnight because it's getting enough coming in even through the filters. All right, we'll grab uh, one last one here before uh, we say uh, adios, goodbye, to Lou for ta-ta for now. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll add all of them in there. Um, okay, you mentioned the love of wolf eels. How many do we have inside of the kelp forest right now? And what are their favorite snacks? We have two wolf eels. And based off of what they look like, I do believe they are a male and female pair. Um, the female is a little pickier, really likes prawns, um, sometimes spits out squid, does not like fish as much. Uh, the male likes everything. Um, the male also really likes interactions with divers. So sometimes even if you're out of food, he still kind of hangs out with you. And he really likes scritchies under his chin. That's his favorite part. All right. Well, I mean, I think with that, that's a pretty solid uh, little bit of rapid fire there, Kelsey. Um, and we're putting the camera just back on me super quick just to thank everybody out there for uh, being a part of this live stream here at the aquarium. Uh, the second episode of Hey, Remember This. If you want to watch a little bit more, we got the sea otter exhibit yesterday with Jessica. Today, this was with the kelp forest uh, with Kelsey. And we are so excited to be able to show this exhibit to all of you folks here once again very, very soon. For those of you who are just tuning in, uh, check the replay. We're going to wrap up here. but We're going to head over to Instagram and TikTok live here momentarily. So more with Kelsey, more from the kelp forest exhibit over on those platforms if you would like. Uh, but just a reminder, the aquarium is reopening imminently. If you are a member of the aquarium, you'll be able to start purchasing your reservations, reserving your time at the aquarium for the special member days, May 1 through 14. And you'll be able to start those online reservations at MontereyBayAquarium.org starting on April 26th. And then on May 5th, for the rest of everybody out there, you can start reserving your times for our May 15th grand public reopening after, at that point, 14 months of closure. So very excited to see you folks again. All the information is over on our website. Again, MontereyBayAquarium.org. And um, for uh, you, Kelsey, final uh, parting thoughts, things you're excited for the folks to see uh, when they're back here. And then we'll, we'll wrap up the, the show. But what do you want the folks to know when they're back here for the first time? That we have been working very hard to take care of these animals. Uh, a lot of people's jobs changed this last year. Mine did not too much because uh, the animals still have to eat. Stuff still needs to get cleaned. So we've been working very hard to, to help take care of these guys. And I am just really excited to be able to share that with the public. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Kelsey, for, for those parting words. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this live broadcast here with the Kelp Forest. We're signing off for right now. Find us over on Instagram and wait for this video to process on YouTube, on Twitch, and on Facebook and Twitter to watch the replay coming up here very soon once that stuff gets encoded on the back end. But this has been Hey, Remember This at the Kelp Forest exhibit from the Monterey Bay Aquarium to all of you folks out there. Can't wait to see you again soon. Thanks so much, everybody.